Hello everybody and welcome to a new video on the Mio Lesson channel. In this episode I'm going to talk about the Sony a7 IV once again and this time I'm going to compare it to the a7R4. Different sensor, different price, but there is much more to analyze. Before we begin, just a few words about the a7R4. It was released in 2019, but in 2021 Sony quietly updated its camera with a new model, the a7R4A, but it wasn't an official upgrade and they are 99% the same camera. The main difference is the resolution of the LCD screen, which is higher on the A model, and that's about it. So in this video you'll see the original A7R4, which is now discontinued and replaced by the A7R4A, but do not worry, they are basically the same. Okay, let's get started. Here we have the A7 IV and the A7R4. The design is very similar and both cameras are dust and moisture resistant. The A7 IV is a bit more bulky because it has a heat dissipation structure inside that allows you to record 4K video for long periods of time without overheating. Another difference is the position of the video recording button which is found on top of the A7 IV and on the rear near the viewfinder for the R model. The one on the A7 IV can be customized. Then we have this sub dial here on the A7 IV which allows you to switch from stills to movie or the SNQ mode. This means you can use the top dial to choose an exposure method, for example aperture priority or manual, when working in still or video mode. With the A7R4, you can only do that for the photo mode. When you want to record videos, you have to go inside the menu to change the exposure method. This also means you can use the memory recall functions for video on the A7 IV. Another neat thing on the A7 IV is that you can keep settings such as aperture or ISO independent for the video and photo modes, so it shows this camera has been designed for hybrid creators in mind that will often switch between the two. There are other small differences, like for example the exposure compensation dial, which doesn't have any markings on the A7 IV and can be customized. Then we have the menu system. The A7 IV features the latest graphic interface and is much better organized than the one found on the R model. Both cameras have 12 custom buttons and a function menu that can be configured independently for stills and video. The A7R4 has an electronic viewfinder with more resolution in comparison to the A7 IV, but every other specification is the same. The extra resolution is definitely welcome on the R model, but admit I didn't find the difference striking when using the two cameras on the same day. Needless to say, there are two excellent viewfinders. As for the rear LCD screen, the one on the A7R4 has more resolution but only tilts up and down. On the A7 IV, the monitor can be flipped to the side and rotated 180 degrees. Both LCDs are touch sensitive but there is more you can do on the A7 IV, including navigating the menu and change settings. There are two card slots on each model and they both work with SD UHS-2 cards, however the A7 IV also accepts a CFexpress Type-A card on the first slot. CF Express has a faster writing and reading speed and allows the camera to have much better buffer capabilities, as I'll show you later on in the video. You also need one when recording 4K 60p at the maximum quality and bitrate with the SNQ mode. Keep in mind that it is much more expensive than an SD card. Concerning the physical connections, the A7 IV has a full size HDMI port, microphone input, headphone output, micro USB and a USB-C port that works up to 10 gigabit per second. The A7R4 has a flash sync port, audio in and out as well, a micro HDMI port and the same USB connections. However, the USB-C port is rated at 5 gigabit per second. On top, they have a multifunction shoe which is compatible with digital audio if you use a compatible microphone. Finally, battery life. They use the same kind and I find the performance of the two cameras to be very similar. It's a good battery and, on average, one of the best among mirrorless cameras. The A7 IV and A7R IV can also be charged or powered via USB. Both cameras feature a full-frame sensor with a BSI design or back illumination, 
but the main difference is the number of pixels. The S7 IV has 33 megapixel, whereas the R model has almost doubled that with 61 megapixel. In this first example, you can appreciate the largest and sharper details rendered by the S7 R4, which is also helped by the absence of any low pass filter. It's not clear if the A7 IV has one or not, but judging from my own experience, if there is one, it is a weak version. The S7 IV comes with the latest updates concerning the picture profiles. It has a new set called Creative Looks, which replaces the old creative style found in the R model. The difference is not always striking, but in this second example you can see how the S7 IV produces more vibrant green on the hill in the background. The difference is a bit more visible with skin tones, where the S7 R4 shows more red dominance in comparison to the S7 IV. Moving on to the dynamic range test, both cameras do equally well. The S7 R4 has a bit more of a green color cast in dark areas, but it's a small difference. With highlights, they are both able to recover the same amount. Then we have the ISO range, which is wider on the S7 IV as you can see on screen right now. I was pleased to see how well the S7 R4 can handle high ISO despite having almost double the megapixel. Up to 12,800, the results are comparable. It's only from 25,600 that you start to see more noise on the R model, and the difference becomes greater from 51,200, where the 7 r 4 is already using the extended values. Needless to say, the highest ISO levels look pretty bad on both. One last thing I want to mention is the possibility of selecting lossless compressed RAW on the S7 IV, whereas the A7R has lossy compressed and uncompressed only. And you can see with this table how much space a RAW file takes on a memory card for each camera. Both cameras feature Sony's hybrid focus technology and advanced algorithm that includes real-time tracking and IAF. The S7 IV also features more phase detection points. In single autofocus, I couldn't find any real difference between the two cameras. They are both fast and reliable. But the S7 IV has one stop advantage in low light, and its phase detection autofocus works up to f22 with medium and high continuous shooting speed, whereas the S7R4 can't manage a smaller aperture than f11. Speaking of low light, here is a test in very difficult conditions, and I was using focus priority. The s 7 IV managed to take a few shots at the beginning of the walk, although they were not always in focus. Then it could not handle it until the subject was close to the camera, where there was more light coming from the right. The A7R4 couldn't follow the walk at all. It only took two pictures at the beginning and then couldn't focus until the very end. Here is another example, this time recording 4K video, and as you can see, the A7 IV does a better job. I did the same test in daylight to see how good eye autofocus is, and the A7 IV does better once again. The camera gave me a very good hit rate of 88%, which improves my first score of 80% that I showed you in a previous video. That is probably thanks to firmware 1.01, which improves the IAF performance among other things. The 7 r 4 has a lower score, not so much because of autofocus images, but because of the larger presence of slightly off results, where the eyes are a bit soft in comparison to the nose or ears of the subject. It also struggled more when the subject was further away at the beginning of the sequence, as well as when she was turning 360 degrees near the end. Here is the same test, but with 4K video recording.
With both cameras, I advise you to use the tracking mode with a small area such as the expand flexible spot. Once the subject is tracked, the camera will give priority to the face or eyes when detected, but can also follow the subject when the face is momentarily covered. It is the setting I use to take pictures of my child and I find it more reliable than other autofocus settings. Continuing with IAF, both cameras can detect animals, but only the A7 IV can detect birds. Furthermore, IAF for the three subject types, human, animal, and birds, work for video, whereas the R model can only detect the eyes of humans when working in movie mode. Bird autofocus gives the A7 IV a distinctive advantage, especially with small birds perched on a tree, because A, you don't have to move a small autofocus point manually, the eye is tracked on the entire frame, and B, you have a higher chance of ensuring the eye of the animal is in focus rather than its body. Moving on to my birds in flight test, the A7 IV gave me an excellent result, close to that of the A9 Mark II. The latter has a faster drive speed, of course, but it shows it's an autofocus system you can trust even with difficult subjects. The A7 R4 is not too far behind. It struggles a bit more when the subject is at a distance, meaning smaller in the frame, where the number of slightly soft results increases. The tracking AF mode, coupled with the expand flexible spot, proved to be the best setting to use for both cameras once again, and gave me the best keeper rate. As always, you can read more about my birds in flight test on my website, the link is in the description. The two cameras have the same drive speed with a maximum of 10 frames per second with autofocus and exposure tracking. The A7R4 looks especially good here considering the higher megapixel number. There are a few things to keep in mind though. The A7R4 can achieve the claimed 10 frames per second only with JPEG or lossy compressed RAW. If you select lossless compressed or uncompressed RAW, the speed drops to about 6 frames per second. The A7R4 can work at 10 frames per second when shooting in JPEG or compressed RAW. With uncompressed RAW, the maximum speed is about 7.5 frames per second. As you can imagine, the buffer capabilities are quite different. The R model can work at the faster speed for about 7 seconds, giving you 70 frames before slowing down dramatically. Interestingly, the buffer is slower to empty when shooting in JPEG and the speed also drops more than when using compressed RAW. The A7 IV doesn't slow down in the first 30 seconds of burst when using the CF Express card. The same result applies with JPEG if you use a SD UHS-2 card, but with compressed RAW, the buffer becomes full after 5 seconds and the speed drops by half. There are a lot of differences to talk about when it comes to video. In short, the A7 IV can do 4K 60p in Super 35 mode and can record 10 bit 422 internally with a maximum bit rate of 600 megabit per second. Here is an overview of everything you need to know. One important thing to understand is that because of the higher megapixel count, the A7R4 does line skipping when recording video in full frame mode. The quality is far from being awful, but the trade-off is aliasing which can be visible when dealing with fine details. For better quality, you need to use the Super 45 slash APS-C mode. On the A7 IV, the maximum quality can be achieved in full frame mode where the camera oversamples from a region of 7K. It also works well in Super 35 mode. At high ISO in full frame mode, the A7R4 shows less noise surprisingly, but the details become softer as you increase the value. I guess the camera applies more noise reduction to avoid too much noise, which will be more severe by default considering the high resolution of the sensor.
In Super 35 mode, the R model does better than the A7 IV and without losing details, up to 12,800 at least. At 25,600, noise remains lower, but noise reduction becomes more aggressive. The difference between the creative looks of the 74 and the creative styles of the R model that I explained earlier on are valid for video as well, but it is less visible in comparison to photographs. The best dynamic range is obtained with the HDR or log profiles. With equal settings using the HLG Gamma, the A7 IV produces slightly brighter shadows, but loses a tiny bit of details in the highlights. The same difference is found when using the S-Log profiles. Bear in mind that with the log curve, the minimum ISO available is 500 on the R model. On the A7 IV, it is 800 and you can select lower values, down to 200, but these are extended levels, so you lose dynamic range as a result. The 74 has an additional setting as Cinetone, which gives you a cinematic color palette. It has a low saturation with the factory parameters, but you can change that in camera or in post. Rolling shutter is more or less the same in full frame mode. It's visible when moving slowly, severe when panning quickly. In crop mode, the A7R4 gets worse, especially when panning quickly, whereas the performance of the A7 IV is much better overall. In my overheating test, the A7 IV was able to record non-stop for two hours without any problem and without the overheat warning appearing on the screen. The R model managed the same result in the same indoor temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. The A7 IV and A7R IV feature 5-axis image stabilization with a rating of 5.5 stops of compensation. The performance, as expected, is similar. Photos taken handheld around half a second or a quarter of a second with wide or normal lenses are not impossible, but the keeper rate is low. You need to work around one tenth of a second or faster to have a decent performance over multiple shots. Like many other Sony full-frame cameras, they can't be fully trusted. I can struggle to obtain a sharp shot around 1 20th of a second or even 1 40th of a second on occasion, so always check your photos after the capture. The results can vary a little depending on the lens used, for example a standard zoom with optical stabilization such as the 24-105mm f4 can push the performance a bit further but what I just said a few moments ago remains valid regardless. The A7R4 has an extra feature that work with the IBIS mechanism, and it is called Pixel Shift Multi-Shooting. When taking a picture with this mode activated, the camera captures 16 photos and, between each frame, moves the sensor by half a pixel 8 times and 1 pixel another 8 times. The result is an impressive 240 megapixel photo. Note that the 16 images must be composited in post using the Sony Imaging Edge software. Also, this mode requires the camera to be on a tripod and with no moving subjects for optimal results. Anything not stable in your frame can create artifacts as you can see right now. The performance for video is not the greatest. Both cameras can produce shaky results, especially when you're walking. The A7 IV also has an active mode which crops the sensor a bit but the performance doesn't really improve. What's more interesting is the possibility to stabilize in post using the Catalyst software. You do this by leaving the stabilization off but the data from the gyro sensor is recorded and the Sony Catalyst software can use that information to stabilize the footage with better results. It certainly is the best solution when you work with a camera.
This review is a bit quicker than usual, as you may have noticed, I didn't talk about extra settings and features but you can find more information about that by looking at the article on my website. Especially the 7.4 has more features to offer, like for example, USB streaming, which is very straightforward and doesn't require any plugin, so make sure to check that out. Right, time to end this video, and I think there is an easy way to make this conclusion. The A7 IV costs less, and from one perspective, it has more to offer, you know, uh, 4K 60p and 10-bit video, better autofocus performance, more customization, and a good amount of extra features. The sensor is excellent, and I believe 33 megapixel is enough for the majority of us, so really you can go wrong by choosing the A7 IV. That said, if we dig deeper, we find that there is a lot to like about the A7 IV, and surprisingly, its 61 megapixel sensor is capable of delivering fantastic images in terms of details, and such high megapixel is also handy for sports or wildlife photographers. I found myself cropping my images heavily and still have 20 25 megapixel left when exporting the photos. The results at high ISO, the levels that count at least, such as 6400 or 12800, are pretty good as well. The autofocus may be worse in certain areas such as IAF, but the performance for birds in flight is fine, making the R model a very capable product for wildlife, and the drive speed is more than decent for a camera with 61 megapixel. In the end, your budget is likely to play a major role in your decision, but otherwise it is important to look closely on what kind of performance you're looking for and what kind of work you intend to do with one of these cameras. And with that said, thank you very much for watching. Don't hesitate to leave a comment or ask any question. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.